Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our panel session today uh, on cybersecurity and privacy of autonomous platforms and robotics with our industry panelists from BlackBerry. So I would like to start by introducing our panelists again, maybe just uh, a quick recap of what uh, Colin mentioned about uh, their respective expertise, but kind of with more emphasis or highlighting things that are related to our panel session discussion today. Um, I will also give each of them a chance uh, to have a short opening statement if they wish to do so. Uh, next, we will go through several key points of discussion that directly relate to the topic of the panel today. I may pause once or twice in the middle to take questions for a few minutes, depending on how the discussion is evolving. So first, I would like to uh, start by welcoming Sebastian again. Professor Fischmeister is a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and cross-appointed with Sheraton School of Computer Science at University of Waterloo. He performs systems research at the intersection of software technology, distributed systems, and formal methods. His preferred application areas include distributed real-time embedded systems in the domain of automotive systems, avionics, and medical devices. The first, of course, is uh, of interest to all of us to get his thoughts on some of the things we will discuss today for robotics and autonomous systems. Next, I would like to welcome Professor Gennaro Notomista. Gennaro is an assistant professor and a Varma family professor in robotics in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Waterloo. His main research interests lie in the intersection of design and control of multi-robot networks for long duration autonomy with application to environmental monitoring. Next, we have Professor Oliver Schneider. Oliver is an associate professor in the Department of Management Science and Engineering at the University of Waterloo. His work connects human-computer interaction, HCI for short, and haptics. So touch feedback from vibration in game controllers to force feedback in teleoperation and rehabilitation. And next, we, have, we would like to welcome our industry panelist, Andrew Wallenstein. Hi, Andrew. Andrew is a senior director at BlackBerry Labs, the R&D division of BlackBerry. He leads a team of researchers focused on cybersecurity and Internet of Things, and he runs the academic partnership program at BlackBerry Labs. He has been at BlackBerry now for 11 years, and prior to that, he was an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette. So, uh, I want to welcome all of you, and I think uh, I'll uh, maybe give a minute uh, if there are any opening comments or remarks that any of you would like to give before we delve into the panel discussion? No particular order. You know, Andrew, if you would like to go first, or Sebastian, by all means. Well, I'd just like to say I'm very happy to be here, happy, happy to represent BlackBerry here. Um, this topic is, like, it's, it's an emerging topic, cybersecurity and robotics. Um, I know it's autonomous systems, but, you know, that's also emerging too. And uh, I think one thing that I, that I was, when I was thinking about the topic, um, I don't think, it, when people think of cars right now, the ones that are on the freeway, the ones on the, on the highways right now, I think it's realistic to talk about them in a really important way as, as robotic systems. We, we talk about co-robots sometimes, collaborative robots. If you look at um, uh, uh, the, the SAE standards for automation, they have different levels of automation for vehicles from non-automated all the way to fully automated. We are not at fully automated. We're probably not going to be there for a while. So where we're going to be le leading is collaborative robotics. You have a driver and a car working together. And the, you know, that is going to be our future for the next little while. We better be paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. And cyber, cyber security and safety in there. Um, yeah, it's a big part. I know there's industrial robotics, there's you know, medical robotics, there's all kinds of other things to talk about too, but you know, that's one that, that people are going to walk into cars tonight, tonight and uh, be in that um, you know, kind of situation. So really topical, really happy to talk about this area. Thank you, Andrew. Sebastian or, or Gennaro? Gennaro, go ahead, yes. Thank you very much again for the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. I am used to work in, in multi-agent system, networked robotics, as they say, uh, where m multiple, multiple agents, multiple robots are connected to each other, but so far, a lot of the, a lot of the, the most of the community actually focuses on the control algorithms, the high level, uh, let's say, coordination strategies. And I think this is a very nice uh, uh, topical, in a way, uh, panel, right, to discuss, to discuss the intersection between uh, the high level coordination strategies and the low-level right, infrastructure when, where, where there is hardware and software uh, considerations to be taken into account to ensure safety and security of these systems. So, excited to be in this panel. Thanks. Thank you, Gennaro. Thank you. 
Sebastian, if, would you like to? All right, we're going or, down the, the, okay, the line, so I see. Yeah. Yeah. Great, yeah, so uh, I'm very excited to be here um, working in haptics and human computer interaction. I'm a little bit adjacent to automotion, uh, automation as well as adjacent to security. Uh, so I'm looking to learn today, uh, but these are topics that are highly uh, of interest to these two communities. The keynote at uh, the CHI HCI conference this year was actually about uh, security and human factors um, with uh, authentication and trust. So that was really, really interesting. So that's something that the community is into. And I think that security is uh, one of those things that the haptics community is sleeping on a little bit. So uh, I'm interested to dive into some new ideas here and maybe take them away to both those things. And while I'm here, maybe be the, the voice of the user um, while, while we chat. Thank you, Oliver. All right, so now it comes online. I, well, I'm all, all obviously also in, very happy to be on here and, and provide my opinion on the topic of cybersecurity for robotics. For me, the key topic on there is that the uh, convergence of safety and security in the area of critical systems. All of you, when you step into a robot, like for example an aircraft, you, you generally have the expectation that you arrive at the destination in one place or in one piece. Uh, same thing on a car. If you step in a car, your general expectation is that you arrive at the other side without a crash. Same thing for your elevator. Over decades, reliability engineering has looked into how do I make sure that there are no random faults that are present in these systems. Now with cybersecurity, this whole topic changes and because you no longer, no longer have the universe flipping bits and uh, creating random faults, you suddenly have attackers flipping bits on purpose and that creates completely new scenarios. Even like, for example, just the question, how should your robot, like an aircraft, react if it suffers a cyber attack? You all turn off your computer and call IT. I guess you wouldn't appreciate if the, air, if the pilot turns off the aircraft and calls IT. So how do you even react in this? How do you react in vehicles when this happens? How should you react in a medical device when it, a cyber attack happens? So there's a ton of questions around critical systems, and I'm happy to explore the topic in the panel. Thank you, Sebastian. So I think at, at this point, probably I want to set the stage maybe for the discussion. So I'm going to start a little bit with some of the things that uh, we usually kind of have to be concerned with when we deploy multi-agent or multi-robotic systems in a networked and connected environment. As we all know, I think uh, that may have been raised earlier in the panel today. October of this year is Cybersecurity Awareness Month in Canada. Uh, as the title of the panel suggests, we would like to focus the discussion today on deployment of intelligent robots and autonomous systems, especially in human-centric environments. That's where usually most of those systems live, in human-centric environments, um, in an interconnected fashion. Think of multi-agent robotic systems, as Sebastian was saying. Usually network connectivity is a must-have in those type of deployments to ensure the robot system can interact with the operator, with the environment, with other robots or agents in a safe and efficient manner to complete some prescribed tasks. Usually some industry sectors, and that has been uh, more evident during the pandemic, suffer from labor shortage, which is a big challenge. Supply chain and warehousing being one of them, uh, agriculture is another one, and some other sectors in manufacturing uh, are seeing more adoption of these actually automation systems, robotic systems, or they're open to it if the solutions do exist. And the reason for that is to combat actually uh, labor shortage, but more importantly, to increase productivity, safety, and again, in addition to many of the other advantages that automation will produce, including throughput. Deployment of connected robotics and multi-agent systems in such application usually will require multi-sensor, multi-sensor modalities, onboard computing resources, as well as reliance on network connectivity for data management and software utilization. Now robots and some of the solutions that do exist for autonomous robotics, autonomous vehicles, multi-agent systems are not prepared for this type of deployment using a typical network with VPN or WLAN connectivity. You begin to run into all sorts of issues related to confidentiality, privacy, and again, we wanted to highlight some of those challenges and how to kind of basically work to resolve them or lessen their effect as much as possible to ensure safety, privacy, and efficient deployment of those systems into those applications. Again, that issue or those challenges are further exacerbated by the fact that regulations, 
that govern the deployment and use of intelligent systems are usually lagging behind in comparison to the pace at which the software and data utilization and how fast this technology is evolving. So that also presents another challenge. There are no bounding box or enough regulations to govern basically how those systems are going to be deployed and how do we achieve the level of confidentiality and privacy and trustworthiness in some of those applications. So with that, actually, I'll start the first question to the panelists. Uh, when we introduce connected robotic systems in some of those applications environments, how can we ensure, like you were saying, Sebastian, that no backdoor attacks are being introduced to sort of compromise the software that drives those systems? And maybe, again, how do we kind of lessen the effects of those backdoor attacks? How can we put kind of like uh, safety measures in place to reduce the effect of something like that from happening? So, Sebastian, maybe I'll invite you to comment first. Sure. So one uh, element that, I, that you point at is the particular expectation that we all have is that we get our devices, when we get our robots, that all of these systems are safe and secure from the start. But how do we actually know? Uh, as uh, William pointed out, that if you develop, for example, nowadays a car that usually has a five-year development cycle, you use hardware that is old, that has potentially uh, cyber risks already inherent in them, and still you expect that when you receive the car that it's good and that it's safe and secure. A big problem what my group is looking at is also now supply chain cyber assurance. So how do you make sure that the electronics that you receive and the software that you receive in these systems does not come with backdoors, does not come with implants, it has not been tampered. Because if you do not start with a clean and good system, all kinds of security measures that you add later on, on top of it, are automatically uh, doomed to fail. And so a particular challenge that you point out is, uh, and I think it's a, a, an open or blank spot still, even in Canada, uh, is on the area of supply chain cyber assurance. There are particular aspects that are being looked at right now. If you look at the Bill C-26, or if you look at what is happening with CPCSC, and that basically will tra uh, translate some NIST standards. Uh, but overall, making sure that when you receive a robot, that this robot does not have backdoors and is safe and secure is a key element so that you can build then other cyber mechanisms on top. Thank you, Sebastian. And Andrew, I think when we were chatting before the panel a couple of days ago, you also had some interesting thoughts about this possibly from the industry perspective. So perhaps you can share this with us as well. Well, I could give you a, um, a couple sort of BlackBerry context. Uh, you know, we were paying attention very closely to the executive order from uh, the Biden administration on um, softer supply chain into the government. And I know this is in robotics, but it's, a, it's contextual for that. Um, the, you know, the, one of the things that they implemented or they, they tried to implement is this software bill of materials. Yeah. So, you know, as, as Sebastian says, you expect that the device you're getting is uh, secure to begin with, but if you don't know what's in it, you, 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 how are you going to get there, right? So the software bill, bill of materials is, is like your first part. What is in it? Um, and so, you know, we, 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 you try to figure out way, ways to try to know what those things are, like if you've got some known vulnerabilities in some of the components, you'd obviously like to know that. But here's a challenge. Um, I don't think anyone expects their robot to be, have the same software the year after that they purchase it. And they shouldn't, because in cybersecurity, if you do cybersecurity best practices, and you look at the NIST framework, and you look at what you should be doing for your cybersecurity, you need to update your system. So that is a changing thing, the software build materials. So how do, how do we manage the secure update and functional safety and, and uh, those, those things together? I don't think we have good, good solutions for that because when, even if you certify your, your, your device, you've looked at it carefully, you know that you're, you've built in all the security you can, um, you want to make changes to it, you know, a lot of them. And uh, sometimes there are even in uh, third-party software you want to put into your, your, your robot. So uh, that's a really big open challenge, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is this uh, dynamic nature. First of all, the size of the software is growing bigger. The complexity of the system is going worse. But the, the rate of change is, is increasing, and we want that. How do we manage our, our, our security posture when we, when we have that change? Really important problem. We don't have good, uh, you know, full answers to that, but we do have, like, we get customers asking for it. Um, there are ways of scanning your, your software. 
but you know, there's always going to be a hole. It's never going to be a full solution. You know, it's good. there's some really good open, open challenges there. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Sebastian, you wanted to yeah, add something? Yeah, just a yeah. very brief thing to add to Andrew's point. If you want, at least for me, your mind blown, please go on your phone, go into the settings, look at about phone, go into legal information, and then look at third party licenses, and then start scrolling. And if you can read all that list in like 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it is just crazy when you look at systems, how much software there is in there, and how much we depend on other third party libraries. And that really stresses uh, as a clear example, the, the magnitude of this problem, and this is on a phone, robotics is not very different from that. Sebastian, maybe do you want to say something about um, checking the components that you get from the factory when you receive it? <laughs> sure, uh, yeah, I'm happy to say something about it, because that, that's, that's the work that we do. I mean, when you look at this, this is on software, but of course the same thing is towards hardware. To give an example, uh, we bought 220 processors on the open market, FTDI microchips, they are in basically every, every USB to serial device. Out of these 220, 100 and now I forgot the number because I'm excited. Uh, anyways, 54% of those were counterfeit. And those were all tempered electronics that are basically uh, brought on the market by other people that are just trying to make a quick buck. And there are companies in the US, you might know about the cyber vulnerability uh, list. Uh, there's a similar thing for hardware. Every week, about 15 new types of counterfeits are listed on that list of an, on the electronic side and your computers, your systems might all be full with it. Thank you, Sebastian. So actually, before we, we move on, I guess I also wanted to hear from Gennaro or Oliver, your thoughts, guys, about this point as well. So Gennaro, maybe if you would like to go next, yeah? Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, when I think of a robot, I think about different layers, right, that the robot is made of. And there is not just the, the software or, or, the, or the hardware, right, but there is the, the, the control that utilizes both the hardware and the software to do something specific. So if I wanted to attack a robot, I would think of attacking it in these different layers, in a way, right, from, from the very top to the very bottom. So if we need to make a robot in a way secure, we need, to, we need to go and think of what to do with the different layers. Uh, so besides making sure that the hardware and, and the low level softwares are, are uh, safe and, and secure, we also can think of uh, ensuring the safety and security at the, at, the, at the higher level, right? So once everything is built, we need to make sure that the robot doesn't break or hurt, right, someone um, when attacked. So this is kind of step two of, 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 the, of the safety and security verification. Um, and also the, uh, the the algorithms, right, that the, are coded, right, some, somewhere might have, in a way, uh, uh, flaws and might be might be uh, susceptible to attacks. And so those should also be verified. Um, that is above, right, the hardware and, and low-level software layer, but also needs needs to be considered um, in order for 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 a robot to be safe. Um, Talking about or thinking about the, the, the control community, right? That is a, a community that thinks in a way uh, um, systematically and rigorously about the behaviors of autonomous systems and more, more, more recently about robots. Uh, there, is a, there is a huge push right, towards not only making a system, autonomous system, a robot, uh, safe and secure, but also resilient, right, afterwards. And this resilience, which is basically changing in a way the behavior of, of the system, but without hurting, right, or uh, the surround, its surroundings, for example, in, in a cobot, right, configuration in industry, or uh, on the highway, right, not crash into, into other vehicles or, or, or humans, um, is something that is actually uh, expanding more and more. Uh, when Very interesting, Gennaro, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oliver, also interested in hearing your thoughts. Uh, sure, I'll try and be uh, relatively brief. I want to echo what Gennaro is saying here in that the complexity, I think, is a major concern when it comes to robotics and automation, because you have to deal with the hardware, the software, the network uh, capabilities, right? You might have several different components all communicate together on the, uh, the same uh, system on the single robot. That might communicate with other agents in an environment that may be connected to the internet or not because we need to use more advanced uh, control mechanisms or some sort of teleoperation. Um, and so I, I think that complexity is a real challenge when it comes to the security um, 
uh, and all the other privacy and safety concerns. Uh, on top of that level, I want to add this sort of social dimension um, and say that we also struggle with competing interests when it comes to checking for security. So for example, if your top priority is to make sure you have a safe, secure system, you go through all the steps, you try and use all, all formal methods, whatever you can to try and uh, keep a system uh, uh, as up-to-date as possible, but let's say you're running a scientific experiment or you're about to send a product out and you need to freeze the version of your software and so you can't update it anymore. Suddenly that introduces new vulnerabilities. And that's a competing interest, that's a business interest or a user interest where they don't have time, inclination, or it's not worth it to them um, to be able to do that security check. And so that kind of competing interest when it comes to larger organizational structures, whether social or organizational like um, businesses or, or um, uh, I don't know if governments would be, I guess, organizational, um, th where security might be a secondary priority, and then suddenly that introduces, you know, as try as we can, we need to find methods that are resilient to those additional complexities on top of the actual systems, technological systems that we create. Thank you, Oliver. So I think uh, that kind of is leading us into, uh, Sebastian, okay, you want no, to add, please go ahead. Yeah. And I'm sure Andrew has mm -hmm. like more, a lot more other examples on this. A very interesting uh, point that you, that, you, that you pointed out is the convenience part, right, for the users that they want this. And it comes from a slightly different area, from safety, uh, but I'm sure Andrew has examples on security, and you all know also uh, how the trade-off between security and the convenience. But just as an, as an anecdote there, the most requested feature for medical infusion pumps was when they made them safe in the sense that you could only limit certain type of delivery and treatments for certain types of medication that was given. The most requested features for doc by doctors was give me a code that I can override any of your rules and I can type in whatever number I want. And basically the company that built that infusion pump well, had to comply with it because otherwise they would not have been able to sell the product. Mm -hmm. And that shows you already the trade-off between safety and convenience. And now in security, of course, there's, it, like, it's everywhere and even more pronounced for sure. Thank you, Sebastian. And I think we're going to come back to this point because really it's a very important point that we needed to expand on a little bit. But uh, now I think uh, continuing the discussion about ways to sort of deal with cyber attacks, uh, I wanted also to get uh, the opinion of the panel on benefits of adopting, like again, with human-robot interaction in close proximity, uh, benefit of adopting zero-trust interaction. For instance, in deployments such as zero-trust supply chain. What are the benefits of that? And basically, how can we leverage something like this to be able to create, again, safer system once they are kind of uh, put on a network and they are basically interacting with the outside world? So perhaps, Andrew, I'll invite you to comment first. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe I can start with zero trust as a, as a topic mm -hmm. because, um, you know, I, I hide as a scientist in a suit uh, and can talk to people in, in business. And what I found is that the number of definitions of zero trust is not bounded by the number of opinions that are out there. Mm -hmm. there's, there's more than the, the, that we have people there. So what you kind of need to say what you mean by zero trust. And one of the, one of the principles uh, in zero trust is sort of a dynamic trust assessment. Um, and I think that's where the, like there's other dimensions, network partitioning and principle of least access and, and you know, reduction in, in the you know, sort of perimeter sort of defense you, you try to take. But um, one of the key principles is there's that dynamic assessment. And you need to have sources of trust. That's where it comes from. You, you, you have, um, if you're trusting too much, you're over-trusting. If you're not trusting enough, uh, then you can't really do much. So you need to find that zero balance of trust, but you need sources of trust. Now, in a, um, now who's, who's trusting whom in this, uh, like a, like a ro human robot interaction, let's say? Well, um, you know, we've got these robots that work very closely with humans, like interactively. And, um, you know, people will want to know that there's a force limit, limit on the hardware. Yeah. That's great, yeah. not enough. They want to know that it's not going to do something really bad to them. So where, where do they get their, their trust from? And it, maybe it's haptics, right? There's, there's some, some feedback that they can get. That's part of it. Um, and then, uh, but even before they get there, they want to know um, the supplier has got certifications. They've got, um, you know, uh, some way of assessing that, not just at the factory, but as things go along. So it is, that, that's really where I think the, the um, 
the intersection of this, this sort of zero trust approach. Yes, we, we're going to do what we do for zero trust everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in robotics, I think it's a little different because you've got this sort of interactive, um, really close personal trust relationship in some cases. Exactly, Andrew, exactly. And I think at this point, probably I will invite also Oliver to jump in. Oliver, again, from your experience with haptics, having the robot or the haptic device interact with the human closely and uh, all the modalities that you put in there. But uh, you also had an interesting take also on it from a human factors perspective. So perhaps you can comment. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I want to riff off that point about trust uh, and say that the, uh, touch is a, a modality of trust, right? Think about the number of times um, someone, um, uh, you know, shake your hand or, or puts your hand, a hand on your shoulder to give you, a, uh, to comfort you in a time of need. Um, you start to trust that person more. This is why uh, servers or, or salespeople might, you know, put their hand on your shoulder or, or kind of bump against you and then you suddenly in, in, trust them because it's proxemic, right? If you let me cl get close enough, to kind of nudge you, then it means there's at least you're letting me get close enough, right? Um, and it's, it's, uh, it builds trust at a social level. So, you know, if you've got a sports team that hug and celebrate and, and high five or, or whatever after a, a, a scoring a goal, um, they tend to perform better. They trust each other and they, they're more in sync. Say, I'm going to say on the ice because we're in Canada, so I'm thinking hockey. But uh, I think across different sports, this is the case. Um, but it's also true at a very deep ph uh, physiological level, right? If you have, Uncertain information coming in from your eyes and uncertain information coming in from your um, sensory, from your sense of touch in an illusion, like a, a bisecting illusion that could be ambiguous both ways, you trust touch, touch more than you touch your eyes. So in a lot of ways, that could be a way to build trust, but as soon as we start to hijack those, those biases um, to persuade people to trust our systems, well, that's now another vector that people might use to uh, trust the system that you want them to trust, but not necessarily that they should trust, right? Um, I'll pause there because that's a, that's a whole lot that we can unpack. I can say lots more about human factors. <laughs> Thank you, Oliver. But I'm sure also Sebastian had uh, something to say about this. Sure, especially about the topic of zero trust supply chain because that is something that, that we are looking at right now. Uh, overall, when you look at currently at suppliers, and Andrew actually brought this up, is oh, they have certifications. Like, for example, what is called the approved vendor list or an approved supplier list. Meaning you filled out a questionnaire where you said, oh, yeah, I'm cyber secure. Sure, you are. I mean, who would not, if I have the chance to sell to BlackBerry, to Boeing, or whoever else? I would be, like, not very smart to say, no, 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 I have, like, all these security problems over there. And the problem is that these process-based approaches are only process-based, meaning somebody fills it out, and that's it. What I look in our research and what we also look into our, in the startup that we have is we look into evidence-based approaches. So what kind of evidence can you provide that your supply chain is actually secure and that your systems that you deliver that are put into an airplane where 250 people rely with their life on that they actually work, that this system is also secure. And the term zero uh, trust supply chain is something that we would like to shape in this to add another opinion and another point in the pool of zero trust definitions. Gennaro, any thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, something, some more comments on the trust when we, when we think about robots. Um, trust between humans right, comes from, from data. Uh, we don't trust a person at first sight. We just need to interact with this person and then we say, okay, this is a, something, someone that I can trust. Same with robots, right? with, but with the bias, initial bias, that robots have done a lot of, uh, um, have created a lot of problems so far. Right? They are hostile. Uh, the movies right, show the robots that uh, steal jobs and they are against us. Um, so there is a first bias that we have. So when we interact with robots, this is like more and more common, for example, in the, in the industry 4.0, we see that if a manipulator robot is helping us doing something and is doing consistent, consistent, uh, in a consistent way, right, is doing it uh, right, properly, then we build trust. And then we can, we can, in a way, talk about this, this, uh, this property, right? This, this trust between, between a, an autonomous system and, and a human. Um, and the interesting thing is that this um, modeling, right, of trust and trying to infuse or code trust uh, in, in a robotic algorithm uh, is something that was born well before the industry 4.0. So I think people were already foreseeing these problems, maybe from the, from the, Asimov's uh, novels, or uh, <laughs> at some point uh, th th these issues came up. And um, uh, nowadays, there is still not a, a, a definitive answer, right? Just because, and 
again, robotic systems are complex. So there, there is not a single way to, to make humans trust robots um, in, a, in a systematic way. <laughs> Typically, again, a very interesting topic, and I think, as Andrew pointed out, like uh, reassuring the human uh, that uh, the interactive robot working with it has, again, like force limits, and it's not going to be able to exert excessive force to hurt the human. But also, having those kind of fluid motions, not erratic, that will basically scare the human, possibly, from thinking of coming close in close proximity with the robot or interacting with it, are some of the aspects aspects that we are researching to try and see how we can improve actually human trust in automation and in machinery. And I think, again, you know, the panel actually raised some very good points. Andrew, perhaps okay. something? Yeah. yeah. I just want to ask, something that occurred to me, I think maybe here, was that uh, as you were talking, um, Sebastian, um, you know, uh, we sometimes have trouble figuring out what to do when the, there's a potential indicator of compromise on the device that's in an end user's device, hand. They're usually not in the position to make um, decisions about the cybersecurity posture of the devices that they hold. Um, you know, they're not, they're not IT, yes. right? Yeah. So what do you do in those situations? And sometimes you just send it out to the enterprise uh, incident response team and they, they have some sort of centralized approach. But it seems to me that if the haptics is where we get a lot of trust, it could be a subtle indicator that you can give to the users about potential compromises of the device. Yeah. Just, you know, maybe yeah, that's a way of, of looking uh, into a new area there. Yeah, definitely an interesting thought. Yeah, definitely an interesting thought. And I think, you know, there are a lot of unanswered questions. So I suspect probably in, in future events, uh, audience, you guys will see us again. Then I'd probably, you know, we will have kind of uh, more insight to offer based on how uh, each one of those challenges are currently being addressed and some of the creative ways to, again, try and resolve or alleviate some of them in the future. So, again, our next topic in the panel is looking at safety and privacy. But before we delve into safety and privacy, maybe we'll open the floor for the audience to ask a question or two about what was covered so far, if you wish to do so. I actually have a question. Go ahead, it's, call it, yeah. It's around uh, the prospect of, of combining safety and cybersecurity, or, or security, as Sebastian's group does. Is there a is there a compromise that's made when um, a critical infrastructure, or airplane, or robot is uh, is compromised that makes it so that you have to maintain safety of the system so that people aren't hurt, or so that infrastructure isn't hurt? Does that in itself compromise security, or are they allowed to be separated? Can you, uh, I'm not sure whether I fully understood the, the question there is, uh, I think the question, if I understood this correctly, and uh, let me rephrase this, is, is about what is a good compromise between safety and security, or was it like, which one of those is more important, or? What's the good compromise? Well, if I knew the answer, I'm happy to have, a, you know, another paper on this. It is really, no, it is really an open question. I mean, ask yourself, you're driving in a car, the car is suffering from a cyber attack. What should the driver do? Okay, you had a second to think about it. If your answer was, oh, to turn off the car and get out of it, the car shuts down and says, I'm under cyber attack, I should get out of it. Well, then you would be very unhappy if you're currently driving out of Fort McMurray during a forest fire where, the, uh, where basically the, uh, the fire is clogging up the air filters, which is changing values, which then triggers your intrusion detection uh, system and that thinks, oh, I'm under attack. And that's why it now tells you, please drive to the site and stop and continue walking. Obviously, that's not an answer. And so I don't really know a general answer, and I'm not sure whether a general answer exists, and that's why it's still, for me, a very interesting, very challenging research topic. Yeah, you're actually right, and I think that's a very good question, Colin, and I think uh, it kind of like uh, very much related to my next question to the panelists, which again, like uh, on the issue of uh, safety and privacy, always very contentious, because typically we don't have a good answer, given the, for instance, the example that Sebastian just mentioned. Um, so when we think about cybersecurity and the ch challenges of deployment of intelligent robotic systems in the network environments, again, we are always looking at this trade-off between achieving the level of safety we are targeting in these applications while concurrently maintaining the privacy of user data being gathered from this human-centric environment. So I'm interested perhaps in, in the panelists commenting on this point. When we put the human and robot side by side, 
and network. The data is being collected about the user. You're interested in preserving privacy, okay? But you also want, you don't want to compromise the performance of the system to a point that safety will begin to deteriorate. So, Sebastian, you want to go first? No, no, yeah? no I, I don't want to go first. I want to just <laughs> rephrase your question. Okay. I think more pointed. <laughs> at what point, at what level of privacy, or what level of privacy are you willing to die for? Right? I mean, that's what you're yeah. asking. It's like, at what point do you sit in the aircraft and say, I know the engines are failing, but I'm not going to give you my personal data because that's privacy. Exactly. <laughs> and so I don't want to answer that question. I just wanted to bring the yeah. question. Definitely <laughs> not an easy question pointed. to answer. Yeah, but I'm, I'm interested also in, in, in the thoughts of the panel. So, uh, Andrew, perhaps you can comment on that also. Not to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> well, I just, I've gone first too many times, I think. Um, so, it's always a, a trade-off. Um, I think maybe the first week I was at BlackBerry, one of my leaders was giving a talk, a talk and he was saying, you know, we know how to make a perfectly secure phone. Perfectly secure. And of course, we were a leader in secure phones for a long time, but he knew how to make a perfectly secure phone, and it was a rock. He showed a picture of a rock. Um, and no one's going to break into it. It's not a problem. It doesn't do a lot, though. And so as soon as you want to do more, then you, uh, you take on risk. And we always treat cybersecurity as a way of being able to take on risk. That's what you use cybersecurity for, is you can do th more things with it. So to me, the, the, you, know, you, you, you build as much cybersecurity and privacy into your products to enable the, the solutions that you want according to how the users are, are comfortable with it. Um, Apple now has a mode where you can turn on um, pretty high secure. Apple's got some pretty secure products out there, but there are 20 companies out there called grayware companies that sell O'Day-backed uh, compromises to, for, to governments, maybe 70 governments around the world. So, um, no, I think it's higher than that. But, um, you know, so, so you've got these highly secure devices that someone spent a lot of money to figure out how to get into. You're going to have the same thing for cars, if it's not there already. You're going to have that thing, same thing for personal robots or medical robots, whatever it is. There are, there are going to be highly secure um, sort of phones and devices uh, that still will have compromises in them. Yeah. But you can have choices in some of those. So Apple has this like private mode, I forgot what it's called. I don't use my phone, but... Um, and you can actually reduce the functionality of your device. It's not quite a rock, mm. but it's somewhere between a rock and a regular iPhone. And um, that gives you a much more secure profile, much, much more private profile if you're like a high value individual or you're a journalist in a contended country or something like you can turn on that mode and, and be better. So I think that's probably, uh, it's about probably you don't want two modes. You probably want a more nuanced uh, collection of those. But it, you, you want the, the customers and um, maybe the customer company, if it's an enterprise, to be able to select their level. Yeah. And uh, that gives you, you can do more, uh, you can be more customized, more personalized. Um, it can, it, you know, just simply um, help you in different ways the more it knows. Um, one last thing about it, that is there is ways to protect some PII and private information. For example, fingerprints on your phones, they don't generally go to a cloud, and even it's networked, and you know, you've got lots of data connectivity. There's ways to hide some private information, and people have been working on that for a while. So I think there's, there's, there's ways to manage that also. Thank you, Andrew. And I guess, uh, uh, Oliver, I'm also interested in hearing your thoughts about this, right? Because uh, your system, like when you're dealing with haptics, and uh, there is a lot of data that is being collected from the individual, but also uh, you don't want to reduce the functionality of your system to a point that will compromise the safety of the user. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I want to go to a point that Andrew's raising here about um, consent and agency for the user, because I think that's where a lot of these things come down to. And this is attention more broadly, I think it's about attention in security, it's also attention in automation. So now we're actually talking about security as automation in a way in that we're automating some of these decisions and then we're offering possibly the user or other agents or stakeholders some sort of choice in what level of security there is. Uh, and that's a very challenging thing because it's a bit paternalistic to, be say, to say, hey, we're gonna make all the security decisions for you and this is the system you get. It's safe to this level and it's secure to this level. Um, but in some cases we can make decisions because we're more, uh, as technology builders, we know a bit more about where we can make these trade-offs and we think that there are reasonable or, or guarantees that we need to provide. So there's some sort of a trade-off. And as we continue to develop uh, 
technology for both automation and for security, I think it's really important to think about the user's agency and their informed consent in the matter. And the informed part is the challenging part because they don't, people might, might not know where their data is going. Like the fingerprint, I assume that it was, I, and I trust Apple that, or whatever uh, device I have, that it's staying on the chip and it's probably um, encrypted, et cetera. But I have some knowledge of, of cryptography, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, and some people might not have any and might not know where it goes. So I think that providing useful, worthy, uh, useful information for people to make informed decisions is probably the criteria that we can use to try and navigate some of these decisions. Um, and then the question is, do they trust system builders when they say that? Or is there, yeah, is there an O-Day that there is lurking in the background, they know that those can exist, right? So, um, and I, uh, just, I have things to say about consent and haptics that I don't know if I want to say now or later, but since I'm talking about it, um, the, this becomes especially challenging when you've got wearables, things that take your biometrics, things that are maybe processed on the cloud or some sort of fitness data, anything like that. And if it's actuated back, suddenly you could have things where a, a system or even another agent is able to touch or evoke touch sensations on you without your consent. And possibly without your knowledge because it can be asymmetric. And so you get some really interesting, challenging things. And consent is a huge, huge challenge that we're dealing with in the haptics community. Um, and so I think, yeah, informed consent and agency are the things that we consider here. Very, actually, very interesting, Oliver, the, the notion of touch through the internet and, and, and how do you sort of control that. Uh, Gennaro, I suspect you also want to jump in on this discussion, so please yeah, go ahead with your comments I've, here. I've been thinking of, of this, this trade-off also a lot in the coordination of, uh, of multiple, multiple robots. So in, when you have multiple robots doing something collaboratively, they need to exchange information, right? otherwise it's not use, use, useful. So there is this communication channel that is the main source of, of attacks. So when you want to do some, when you want to achieve some, some uh, global behavior, right, coordinated behavior in a, in a private way, what you do is just to send an encrypted message, which is not really encrypted, it's just noisy, right, so that at the level that the, whoever receives this message can do something useful for it, right? So, and this is something that, a technique that is used uh, actually in all phones to transmit data to the cloud. Um, it was, it was developed a few years ago as known as differential privacy, right? When there is this kind of parameter that you can set, how much noise do I put and how much performance do I get out or can I get out? If I want to in a connected uh, autonomous vehicle coordinate on which car is gonna charge, right? For example, at, a, at, a, at a, an electric charger at some point, um, I will need to exchange information on my battery or where I'm going, right? So these, these are all things that we might not wanna, wanna, wanna give. But if this, in a way, goal is, is achievable with some masking, right, of this information, then we can still get both performance and privacy out of, out of it. In a way that an attacker cannot do anything by collecting, gathering this data, right, intercepting this data uh, on the communication channel, but we can still, as a system of connected autonomous vehicle, can do something useful of it. So I think there is, from a theoretical perspective, the possibility of developing something that is very useful in practice to achieve both performance and privacy. Obviously, there are the, the, the physical limitations that we, we discussed about <laughs> in the plane, right, giving our birth date or not, not to die. I think, Gennaro, you made a comment, but Sebastian only gave an example. So, Sebastian, I don't think I got your full thought on this. Everybody else did, but probably I'll have, like, the final word for you on this subject. No, it's just uh, one thing that I wanted to, to add to this is that, interestingly, in the safety domain, these decisions have already been made. I don't know how you could make similar decisions in the security domain. When I mean in the safety domain, these decisions have already been made. For example, it's perfectly fine for all of us if we live here for 211,000 years to experience a nuclear accident in one of the nuclear power stations. Why? Because the highest safety level in these systems is 10 to the minus 9 per operating, fee, uh, per operating hour. And it's just a threshold that engineers set down and said, that's good enough. And so if you sit here for the next 211,000 years, then you will experience most likely some kind of, ex well, hopefully not, but most likely some kind of hazardous situation. Not necessarily that leads to an accident, but a hazardous situation. Interestingly, I have no clue how this could be done in the security yeah. domain, yeah. but it would be interesting to think about this, how this trade-off or basically these type of criteria with respect to private information or uh, yeah, other types of, of, of privacy-related uh, information uh, how this could be done there as well, but I don't know. 
I think, you know, the, again, we accept the fact that there is a trade-off. But now I think that's prob this problem is getting more and more complicated uh, in the field of robotics, connected robotic systems, but also in other areas of applications where you have to live with this trade-off. Now with robotics applications, when we begin to add artificial intelligence on top of those systems, including chat GPT, deploy large language models, and you're relying on big data, how does that actually further complicate this issue of trying to find the sweet spot or, or, or good balance, which again, we haven't solved. We accept the fact that it's there, but it will actually be further complicated or further amplified when we begin to adopt more and more artificial intelligence in those connected systems. So perhaps, Andrew, I'll, I'll invite you to share your thoughts on this subject. Yeah, so, I mean, we just had a, um, a very nice talk on trustworthy AI, yeah. um, you know, and that, you know, there's a lot of great, great work in there. I, I don't want to, since you've already heard the talk, I don't want to say anything about that. Uh, one thing, that I, and I don't, I'm not sure if this is just me being worried about it, but I worry that this is a, a problem for these advanced AI systems. We know already in large language models that are disembodied cognitions. They live in cyberspace in some server compute cloud out there. Um, we know that they have hallucinations. Um, and we know that also that when we've trained them with massive amounts of data, we get these emergent behaviors. That's things that the designer didn't figure was going to be in there. That's not a comforting feeling. And so, um, you know, how do, we, how do we know, how do we predict what's going to go on when these um, really, really complicated AI solutions are being, being built? I don't think we got that in the cloud space. Now you add robotics, and that's an embodied cognition. That is a brain that's sitting in, a, in a, like a body that has interactions with the world. Um, and, you know, th that's, I think that's a level of um, unpredictability to add to the equation. So I worry that even if we have some solutions in the, the sort of disembodied space, uh, and we're going to be putting them into embodied solutions, and um, we really won't know the sort of emergent behaviors that are going to come out of them and not be able to predict them. That's a worry for me, and I think it's a robotics, mm, like that's where it comes to a head, uh, is because we're going to see these very, very quickly, and uh, I think we're going to be, you know, unfortunately surprised. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. You know, like uh, worrisome, but, but definitely a very good point. So Gennaro, perhaps, you are kind of directly immersed into this problem to a great extent, so also interested in hearing your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, my answer is uh, it uh, will, it will uh, extremely complicate uh, the, the, <laughs> the safety and security issues because, um, you know, the, the AI and, and, and um, machine learning is used in robotics mainly for perception, right? So bef before, before AI and machine learning, the robots were, were, were using very simple perception algorithms. Um, nowadays, they are able, using deep learning, for example, for machine, uh, for machine vision, right? They're able to identify objects and to figure out where, what they're doing in the environment so on. Up to some noise, right? Because you can adversarially attack this, this so piece of software, pieces of the software that uh, solve the perception problem for the robots and get out whatever you want, actually. So an attacker that is intelligent enough can actually make uh, a robot uh, think that is seen whatever uh, they want. Right? And so um, this is a huge problem. The interesting thought is here is that uh, we also learn from data, right, as human, um, as, as human beings. Right? We, are, we start fresh, um, almost, right? But then we, in a way, uh, learn from data and then uh, build models inside, kind of what deep learning is, kind of, is trying to imitate. Uh, but we are not so susceptible to these kind of attacks. So the, I think we should, we should think about more, since we got a lot of inspirations right, from, from nature in, uh, in designing these machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence algorithms, we should also think why are we inherently stable in a way, right? If you are trained to look at the world and identify people, we don't think that a person at some point is gonna be a truck, right, on, on the highway, um, as easily in a way, right? So I think, most of, of this comes from, uh, comes from the hardware, right, of which we are made. And so the hardware that we use to train and to, and to, and to um, execute these algorithms on, on uh, autonomous systems, I think should be uh, co-designed, right, with the algorithms. Thank you, Gennaro. And I think, Oliver, I'm also interested, like I think as Andrew mentioned, looking at those basically big data models. And uh, typically, you know, like large language models and other type of machine learning is usually powered by a form of connectionist model or a neural network typically. And those are trained on very large data sets. But you really actually, once you train them, it's like a black box. 
typically inside, you have no idea really how to manipulate it. Now you put this in close interaction with a human and you have the liability issue because there is kind of an unknown element, as Andrew mentioned, about predictability. So that actually, again, compounds the problem that we were discussing earlier about the trade-off between safety and uh, privacy. And you, will, you think that that will be a deterrent from adopting the state-of-the-art AI technology in haptics application? Yeah, I mean, I remember building a haptic device. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Uh, I remember building a, a pantograph force feedback cap device. Uh, for those who don't know what this is, it is two motors mounted with uh, aluminum linkages in a diamond shape, um, and then it can move around. And it is strong enough, has very high torque motors that can push your arm around and resist your arm. You can, you can overpower it, but it's hard. And I remember programming it, and I had uh, you know, a, a bug in my code that had the wrong number, and it would just snap shut like scissors. Uh, this fortunately happened very rarely. No one was hurt by it. We put in some safety net mechanisms, and you can put in like <laughs> hardware constraints like that. But you have to imagine, if you have a black box system that is trained on a, set, a finite set of examples that is highly nonlinear in how it's you know, producing its outcome, any unpredictable emergent information or, or, or act, um, outcome, especially when in close proximity with a, with a user or a person or, or an environment even, uh, could lead to you know, some really challenging results, right? As soon as you have an actuator, you can act on the world. And that means that whether it's with a human, whether it's a control loop in a nuclear power plant or a plane, whatever it is, um, you have to be very, very cautious with these kinds of constraints. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've personally been looking more into open box methods that are a little more explainable. Um, but, you know, it, it ramps up the priority and the urgency of explainable AI and all these other kinds of techniques when, uh, when you're dealing with real-world applications in close proximity with people. Very good point, Oliver. And actually, uh, Sebastian, before I invite you to share your thoughts, Andrew, you wanted to make a comment also? Yeah, just a quick okay. comment on that. I mean, we had a great keynote earlier today from MasterCard. Um, uh, Ms. Sloan was talking about um, billions of dollars uh, in economy and cyber, cyber security. And I noticed that it says cyber security, not cyber physical security and privacy. But um, when you get robots involved and they have actuators, that's a force um, uh, enabler. And uh, the conversation, I mean, I suppose you could put everything in terms of money, but the conversation can easily turn into life and limb. And instead of talking about millions of dollars being lost, I mean, if you, can, if you have a remote attacker that can, can um, mobilize um, an army of autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, it's not one vehicle. It's an army of autonomous vehicles, then you're talking about unintentional killer bots. It's a different conversation. Absolutely, yeah. And I think we, we discussed this briefly before the, the panel, you and me. Again, Sebastian, I'm pretty sure from uh, basically safety critical systems point of view, you also have a few things to share? Sure. I mean, uh, overall, Everybody sits in a car, you all expect that the car drives you safely from one point to another and doesn't explode in the middle and doesn't suddenly veer to the right or what is a known problem is the sudden unintended acceleration which was in the press uh, actually quite heavily in the past uh, decade. So overall, uh, of course, adding machine learning is a problem there and I think especially what a lot of people underestimate is the creativity, boredom and amount of free time of teenagers. I mean, you give them these systems because what they will do is they will tinker with them. They will figure out, hey, what can I make this system do that it's not designed to do? How many street signs can I prop up in front of my house that makes all my neighbor's cars drive in a circle around like the roundabout? Whatever. It's basically just people like to tinker with technology. And whether that's the robot like an autonomous vehicle or that's a robot that might sit in your house or make your ca coffee machine do something that it's not supposed to be doing. There are certain groups of people that have a lot of free time and are very curious and very technically inclined. And I think it's a group that is still not properly considered when you make safety cases, especially around uh, cyber security and uh, machine learning type models. Thank you, Sebastian. So I think at this point in time, again, I, I will maybe open it to the panelists. Any thoughts on this subject before we move on to the next one? Any additional thoughts from any of you? I have one oh, yeah, very short one. So, I mean, in, in, auto, in, like in cars, but I'm sure in robots, there's gonna be a right to repair. And that means the, there's a third-party ecosystem for components and software. 
And um, basically, you have to hand the keys to people you don't trust. There's no other choice if you have right to repair. And I think we, I think as a society, we'll want right to repair to, for these things. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. So I think that actually brings me to the last point of the panel discussion, still on AI, but now looking at, uh, uh, the, again, the effect of AI on privacy when it comes to the type of bias that AI will introduce into an environment that is human-centric, or when robot is interacting, or machine is interacting with the human. How can we kind of limit the effect of those biases and unintended outcomes, including, for instance, perceptual, social, other type of biases? So I think for that one, I think I'll ask Oliver if you can basically kick that off with your thoughts. I can try. Yeah, that's, a, that's a big one. Give it your best shot, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, bias in training sets is, is a huge problem, and um, I am no expert on that area. I think l there's been a fair bit of work on increasing the diversity and, and, um, and robustness um, of those kinds of training sets. I think that you have to think, again, I'm going to push the social angle and the human angle, but you have to think more broadly, where to have... Um, uh, to avoid biases of the technologies that we build, you have to avoid biases in the people, the teams that create them. And so, uh, you are more likely to catch these issues if you have a diverse team, if you are thinking about ethical concerns when collecting this data to begin with, um, and you maybe make it a dedicated role in, in your team somehow. Um, and I think that it needs to be from the top. I think you really need to push down, and when you're developing these types of systems, uh, before even thinking about collecting any data, you need to start centering some of these concerns um, because it will lead to better technology and better outcomes in the long run. Thank you, Oliver. Yeah, and I think the bias is usually inherent in the data, the way you collect the data and the way you train the machine. So I think, uh, Gennaro, also I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Like, uh, how do we sort of take care when we develop the machine learning models that capture data, data about the environment or data about the population, how do we sort of take care when we collect this data to minimize the effect of bias in addition to what Oliver shared? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I was thinking of yeah, both, both ways, right? Mm. You can have bias between, between humans and robots and robots and, and humans. Um, the ones on, between robots and humans, to, from robots towards humans, uh, comes down to, to choosing, right? Selecting the, the right data, and this is very much uh, an open question, um, not only for bias, for, but for any behavior, actually. Um, so I would say that the long life learning, right, is something that, uh, that, uh, that would, in a way, uh, try to answer questions like that. There is no, no um, God that selects data, right, and, and tell you need to train your robot with this, because why does this God not have a bias itself, right? Or um, th th there are these kind of philosophical questions in the end, which come down to, to information uh, theory, right, that is uh, able to explain what is included in those data. So um, in a way, that should um, somehow rely, right, on uh, the, the, the way these situations, right, of interaction between human and, ro human and robots are presented and are, um, in a way, uh, presented to the general public, right, that do not maybe have um, too much uh, knowledge, right, about what's underlying right, the uh, building an autonomous system, both in its hardware and its uh, software, but can, in a way, get uh, away or out of these of this, um, of this biases, right? Mm -hmm. so, Interesting, yeah. But it's a difficult problem, I would say. Great, thank you, Gennaro. And I think Sebastian also was interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic. Well, my concern, and, and mm -hmm. I absolutely agree that there needs to be proper diversity in the training data set and these kind of things. But one very interesting point that I want to raise, and I would love to get like uh, answers to this, is um, how do you make sure that when you have end-to-end -end trained systems, meaning the system receives sensor inputs, just has some form of, of algorithm uh, that you cannot understand, and then makes decisions based on the outputs, how do you make sure that these type of systems are not like a Manchurian candidate, where you have this robot in your house, you deploy the million of these systems, let's say you sold them to Canada, and then suddenly somebody makes a ransomware call and says, hey, you know, in this data set, in the training data set, we included something that we know when we present that signal, 
all of these systems would blow up. And to give you a simple and a very simple example, if you are able to, for example, just eliminate the feedback loop on a temperature sensor on a coffee maker, you can burn down houses. Same thing on a, uh, same thing on a fridge or a car battery. So how a very interesting, and I know it's not <laughs> to what you ask about diversity. What I'm interested in is also, well, how do you make sure that in your diversity, there's nothing in there that is being used to then deliberately trigger or can be used to trigger an attack? And I don't have an answer to this because yeah. you don't see, you don't understand what the network does in all, in all corner cases. Yeah, yeah that's an another very interesting take also, Sebastian. So, uh, Alex, I think I'll uh, give you the final word on this subject to share your thoughts with us. Oh. Yes, Alex. <laughs> so, I, I don't know if I have too much to I would say, though, that, in a, you know, I think BlackBerry is concerned, I think we all should all be concerned about uh, uh, DE&I from technology access point of view. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this isn't exactly how to solve the bias problem, but it is a call to, to look at bias, uh, even in the sort of things that we build, uh, how we build them and for whom. Um, you know, it could be too easy to have, like, there just won't be equitable access to the best AI in the world if we don't ensure it. There won't be equitable access to the best robotics in the world if we don't ensure it. So it's a concern, I would say. Okay, so I think, you know, like, uh, interesting discussion. I, I think at this point, uh, uh, I would like to open the floor again for questions from the audience. I can't be the only one with questions. I do have one, though. Um, yeah, trying to formulate my question here, but uh, it's in regards to the subject of zero trust supply chain. Uh, Sebastian, probably more directed to you, but I'm sure the panelists can answer that. But as a consumer, um, um, someone who's also procuring devices, um, what is being done to, to protect us uh, from crime? from uh, compromised devices, uh, especially uh, when they're coming from the manufacturer. Um, a story that I recently read was, you know, phones being compromised from, you know, from the manufacturers, and it's, it's pretty scary as a, as a thought, but, you know, someone who is procuring devices for their staff, um, and to think about that kind of level of uh, security, uh, you know, what's being done to try to, to protect us as consumers, and uh, what's the future look like? Well, so let me first give you a piece of bad news. And I don't know whether people see this, but what I have in hand here looks like a USB cable. But what you might not know is that you can go on the, onto the web right now and buy USB cables that steal data from your phones. Because you can already embed a full computer in just the USB connector, and that then acts as, an, as, a, as a keyboard, and that then allows them to extract data, and they communicate up to two kilometers away. How much? Do people think that this costs? Well, if you look at the Snowden leaks from a couple of the decade ago, it cost $25,000. Now you can buy this for $75 on sale. It's one of the reasons why, for example, the FBI issued uh, recently the choose checking attack notice again that when you go to a public place, you should not plug your phone into any uh, into any USB port that you have anywhere because people can easily add uh, electronics on there. With respect to your point about uh, malware in consumer devices, it absolutely is the case. There was just recently the, the release about um, malware, not malware, but basically uh, modified firmware in network switches uh, that, where you have magic packets that then suddenly enable certain functionality. Uh, the answer that we have, or uh, what, what we look at, is how can we do this for safety critical systems? Because these are the systems that, I'm sorry for all your phones and for all your, you know, your computer mice and all your, your gaming computers or whatever. I, like the, the society as a whole doesn't care about them. The society as a whole cares whether the nuclear reactor blows up or not. And so we are looking into how can we ensure supply chains for critical systems. And that is the first step. And I think after we have sorted out there how to do this reliably, on the software side, like SBOM, what BlackBerry does, uh, and also then on hardware, what, for example, we do, then we can look into consumer devices on how to make this more secure. So that means in the short while, 
well, buy from trusted vendors or um, don't, and don't plug in your stuff into other people's USB ports. And don't accept USB on, uh, at conferences. It's, it's amazing. You go to defense conferences or security conferences, they still hand you USB gear. There's a company here in Waterloo that sent out for Christmas a USB gadget to all their customers. I, I mean, anyways. So a list of do's and don'ts for now. Uh, Andrew, do you, do you want to also comment before we take the next question? I guess so. We do, okay. So I'll, I'll, yeah, quick comment, like maybe on the affirmative. Like we have devices, which we, th we used to have devices, which we considered pretty critical because they were in the hands of heads of state, for example. And so people did care about it. And I, I don't know how, how you as a consumer can really access this, but I wanted to give you at least some kind of good story. Um, we had, uh, has anybody here heard of Sunday Run? Something like a, called a Sunday Run? No. Um, it turns out when you turn off the manufacturing of devices um, and people go home for the, for the week and they're, they're in, they're, Sunday comes along and there's, there's nothing ha supposed to be happening, well, sometimes something does happen and that the, you get these devices that are built looking exactly like their original supposed to be device, but they're made by people who just want to make the same thing and not say that they made it, right? So they, it can be a gray market device. So what we had is it, we had uh, ways of embedding cryptographic signatures into our hardware. And that became our hardware root of trust. And if you wanted to engage any of our services, the, the phone would have to uh, have an attestation that that was actually our phone and not one of these ripoff phones. Now, I don't know who, who does that right now and how you can get access to it, but there are ways. We know of ways to do it. Um, and, you know... It's, uh, it's, it's possible to, to have some measures, also Sebastian's company has some measures that we can uh, hope, hope to see in more, more widespread use. But there is, is some hope on that to get a little bit better control over it. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Colin, there was another question? Uh, he had to go to a meeting. Okay. So again, yeah, questions from the audience? Panelists. So there's a question on the front here. Yeah, I think, yeah, we can get you the microphone so that uh, the folks in the back can also hear you. So my question is a bit general. Um, so the point is that we start caring about a cybersecurity attack after that there is an incident or there is a report happening, right? For example, you showed me that, yeah, you showed us a list of the third parties on our phone. So me as a end user, I will not care about any of them. I said, okay, I have my phone, it's function, and as I wanted, and it's okay. But the moment that on the news, there is a report that this application is stealing the information or this happened and that happened, we all care about it, we go and we'll delete it, and then the rest of the companies, they're still saying that, oh, we are secure about this vulnerability that happened in that application, and etc. So I had this always in my mind that how we should raise this concern about cybersecurity, like we can call them weaknesses, before or prior to cybersecurity incidents, specifically for the end user. So who would like to take this one? Sebastian, do you want to take I can just briefly say, uh, I think the major problem there is that you currently can sell devices that are uh, not secure, and if something bad happens, well, bad luck for the customer. Okay. It's being at the market fast right now and iterating in the market is more important than any kind of repercussion or, or punishment that you get if you have, if you leak data or if something bad happens, unless it's in certain areas, like for example, a nuclear-based power production or aircraft where, well, you really want, don't want to be in the news. Uh, but everything else, every startup, look at the cheap uh, IoT garbage that's sold on AliExpress. I mean, just go there and buy it. I had a couple of students look at stuff. It was fantastic. Like I gave them as the, the fourth design project, they gave them a couple of devices. There was a an, an Wi-Fi enabled power strip. That power strip had the root password for the power strip in the Android application hard-coded. 
And again, I'm pretty sure whoever these scientists knows about this problem and they just don't care because somebody told them we need this on the market tomorrow. And I think the major problem is that no real punishment for cybersecurity incidences, and I'm not sure whether there should be any, so I don't want to give an opinion on this, but I think that's one of the, the problems. Thank you, Sebastian. Gennaro, any thoughts, you or Oliver? Sure. I mean, it comes down to, I think, incentives, right? So business incentive for the company to get something on the market quick, it's not going to have security built in necessarily. So if you want to protect end users, you need to find ways to incentivize them. And the thing is, it, security is not always exciting. It's, you know, we might all love it, but, you know, make sure you've got two-factor authentication. You make sure you use a password manager, all these kinds of things. Don't plug into USBs. But if I'm low on power on my phone and I'm, and I'm sitting on a plane and someone's got a, a charger I can use and I'll plug it into the airport, in the airline, suddenly, you know, I'm compromised, right? So you have to kind of maintain consistent um, concern about that. And I know so many people who groan every time they have to do a second uh, two-factor authentication sign-in, right? Because it's just like, you know, and, or, or don't use a password manager. Like, there's a reason the most common passwords, I, I'm not sure if it's password or one, two, three, four, or there's a list of them. The top, top 10 are like just this, whatever is the quickest thing to give someone access, right? And so you have to either build in procedures that, that uh, or, or evidence-based systems or something, some sort of procedures to be able to um, make sure that people have to go through the steps or incentivize them to do so through persuasive computing or gamification or other sorts of you know, ways of hijacking our um, emotional systems or, or game playing systems or whatever to incentivize us. But then, yeah, so I think that's it. Either you incentivize them or you, you make it so that people have to do it. Um, but left to our own devices. And the thing is like sometimes you might want to. I didn't want to buy a smart TV when I, had to, when I had to upgrade like a year or two ago and it was the only thing that I could buy that was reasonable. And so now it's connected and I've got apps and everything that's it got access to my Wi-Fi. It's like, well, cool. I, I, I was fine just plugging an HDMI cable in, but oh well. And it's very convenient. So I now have accepted it, but it's probably a huge security risk. So there we go. Advice, Oliver Gennaro, maybe. Yeah, just a quick add on. <laughs> sure. um, since we talked about a lot of trade offs, right, here is, is very much a trade off. Um, it's not in, in incentives, but I mean, the incentives are very related to the interests, right, that there are behind. If, uh, if something has to come to the market tomorrow, someone else, like the government of some, some country, is interested in that, right, in fostering the economy or, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a chain that has some trade offs at all steps, and there is very much, I mean, very little we can do. I'll, Fortunately, the internet right, is kind of the democrat democratization of this, so we can all try to try to do something about that, right? So we don't need the government necessarily to do something, right? Um, and choose like the the, the trade-off that we also like, um, but we can in a way um, do it ourselves, right? And social networks are also a great <laughs> tool for that. Thank you, Gerard, tool yes. for that. And Alex, maybe. So, any, any so I'm going to maybe, maybe break the, the sort of pattern that we would have in a panel and, and turn the audience's question into a new question uh, for our panelists and you. Um, you know, if you have, there's vulnerable, uh, sorry, there's disclosure laws, there's mandatory disclosure laws in many different jurisdictions where if you get breached, you have to say that you got breached. And so there's an awareness that's being generated out into the community of the security concerns that you might have and there's some different organizations, but you can do it for applications, you can do it for robots and all these things. So if, but the thing is, you, so it's, it's a really good thing to know about the security problems that are in our systems. But also, I think it could desensitize the, the, the customers. So it might even be a bad thing. So that's my question. Overall, is it better to have a lot of disclosure or worse to have a lot of disclosure? Okay, that's very interesting. You guys want to take this on now? <laughs> I think we're nearing the end of the well, panel. But yeah, I, 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 I think you are, were, definitely. Yeah, I thought you were saying that, oh, we need disclosure. <laughs> and I would, I would have immediately pushed back on that simply because who of you is not going to life labs now in order to get your blood work done? I don't think whether there is even an alternative in Canada or in the region here. They had a huge uh, leak just recently, if I remember this correctly, where they leaked data and I know about it because I checked even whether some of my data is on there. Do I even have an alternative now? Even if they now disclose it that, oh, we had a security leak or we had an incident and we leaked data. So what? I mean, good luck finding somebody else. Same thing in the US. I forgot who was it who leaked all the social insurance information 
there was like this huge company, and I forgot which one, and you see that's already bad, like I already forgot. Equifax? Equifax. Yeah, I think yeah, Equifax, Equifax, yeah. yeah. Like, so what's the alternative? Yeah. What's happened there? Can you even choose a different provider? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I guess we have the time for one more question, or? No? Okay, so I think we're nearing the end of the panel session, so I again would like to thank our panelists for a very informative and interesting discussion today. Thank you, Sebastian, Alex, Oliver, and Gennaro. Uh, and I want to thank again the organizers of this, the CPI conference today, uh, Colin and George in particular, and the rest of the team for all the effort that you put in. And for the audience, thank you for sticking around. I know it's been a long day for all of you, but uh, we hope to see you here again in future CPI conferences, and have a great afternoon, everybody.